We are live. This is exciting. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today here. Uh, it is truly a privilege uh, to be able to discuss such important topics and to have such a Uh, and how it's allowed us to stay in continued and constant uh, communication and to have really great and important conversations. And I know this one uh, is quite global. Uh, I'm Alan Fleischman. I'm the founder and chairman and CEO of Laurel Strategies, and we are a global CEO advisory firm. We work with CEOs and their leadership teams on strategy, messaging, positioning, and we get to work with some of the most formidable leaders from around the world. And today, uh, we're able to really discuss um, with formidable leaders from around the world uh, some of the most important uh, issues uh, that we need to deal with, especially around this moment. We're transitioning, hopefully, with the rollout of the vaccine into beginning to imagine what has changed and what needs to change in this post-COVID-19 pandemic world uh, and really start to think again in this country, but also globally in the United States and globally, this is a focus today is on the U.S., um, how we need to deal with some real inequities in the world, whether it's uh, racial inequality, uh, whether it's business and civic leaders taking on big issues around technology, uh, and whether it's really about the four C's, you know, climate change, culture, cybersecurity, uh, which is a big issue I know for some of our panelists, and, and obviously the ongoing pandemic, uh, which we need to prepare ourselves for those variants and mutations. How we will reaffirm and reintroduce a stronger capitalism um, is also important as we discuss what it means to be disruptive, but more importantly, what it means to be inclusive uh, as we really want to build a better, more diverse capitalism and even democracy. So as we search for solutions, uh, it's clear that the private sector matters in many ways even more than public sector and civil society to lead the way. And that's pretty new uh, in our world, this grateful appreciation that they run. So let me give you an idea who we're going to be talking with today. We've got Lisa Edwards, who's the president and chief operating officer at Diligent Corporation. Uh, and prior to Diligent, Lisa was the executive vice president and strategic business operations officer at Salesforce. Her leadership at Diligent has included piloting a major initiative called Modern, Modern Leadership, which seeks to create diversity in American boardrooms, actually global boardrooms, in order to ensure that companies look like the communities they're serving. Uh, Diligent is an extraordinary platform, 700,000 users, 19,000 organizations, and it'll be interesting to hear from a governance and board perspective, uh, all that Lisa is leading uh, with her colleagues at Diligent. Uh, Ambassador Michael Froman is the vice chairman and president of strategic growth for MasterCard. Uh, from 2013 to 2017, he served as the United States Trade Representative, and prior to that, he served as the Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economic Affairs in the White House under the Obama administration. Uh, he's had many posts in both public sector, private sector, and civil society, and he really is a leader that can speak to how we need to integrate power and influence uh, across all three sectors. Tom Siebel is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of C3AI, I'm going to say, going to say it right, C3AI yeah. um, uh, is a leading AI software provider. Uh, Tom has been ahead of the curve and leading conversations around digital transformation and e-commerce, uh, cybersecurity, and technology uh, for, for really a very long time. He had a company that sold to Oracle. He's been a serial entrepreneur. And most recently, he published a book called Digital Transformation that I am reading right now, and it's amazing how we need to survive and thrive in the era of mass extinction. Talking to Tom today about what we need to do, what we ought not to do, is an important part of how we manage ourselves in this disruption. And Reba Qureshi, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Verizon. Reba has more than two decades of leadership, experience in mobile communications, and insight into the digital divide. Both she and Ambassador Frohm and Mike are representatives of their companies on the Edison Alliance, which has really been working to overcome those deserts 
the broadband deserts in particular that affect us globally in communities and countries worldwide. Uh, there is a broadband desert and to get to all the other things that we need to accomplish in our society, we need to actually create access. So those are who are joined together, it's an amazing group. And I thought I'd start, if I could, to all of you and ask a question, uh, you know, over the last year, that's very long, 12 months since, uh, since we are, we're all in lockdown, we've seen executives from all sectors and regions respond to internal and external challenges in the wake of the global pandemic. What are some examples where you've seen leaders in your own industry in particular, but leaders in general, rise to the occasion and what can we learn from them, especially in the private sector? Tom, do you want to start? Well, let's see, who has done a particularly good job of, you know, uh, of, of leading in the space? You know, I think that, you know, clearly the technology companies are out there. I think the banks have done a simply wonderful job. I mean, it's pretty amazing, you know, when you think about it, about how resilient all the, you know, we look at financial services, we look at telecommunications companies, we look at banks, we look at uh, manufacturing companies. I think there's been an enormous amount of resilience, okay, in managing under, you know, incredibly trying times. And um, I think this is an area where the bigger companies seem to be more successful at pulling it off. I think the people who have been left out in the cold, you know, are very much the small and medium businesses, the people on Main Street that have, you know, are just, um, I think the damage that has been uh, wreaked there is, um, you know, you know, I hope it's fixable, but I think it's been very difficult for these people. Yeah. Rima, what are you thinking? Um, it's hard to uh, point to one specific person, Alan. I, I think uh, obviously the healthcare heroes and everything that they have done to uh, remain focused and deliver um, the care that we can't live without. Uh, I think it's the ones that we don't really think about in terms of names, all of those nameless people that we are used to uh, just not really even thinking about, those that are delivering packages, those that are uh, serving us in um, in the grocery stores, those are, that are the most at risk. I think they're the real heroes here. Uh, of course, we have all done our part, which we need to do, but I think um, it's those unnamed folks that I would like to bring up. That's wonderful. And Mike? Well, I agree with the, with both of those comments, and I do think there's been a sort of a convergence of different dynamics over the last year. Even before COVID, you had CEOs beginning to think through what's the appropriate role of the corporation in society. You had Larry Fink's letters, you had the business roundtable statement, things of that sort. Then the COVID came. COVID, the collapse of small business, as Tom said, and racial equity issues in the United States coming to the fore have really forged a, uh, a crucible where CEOs have had to figure out, okay, what are we going to do differently as a company going forward? They were already there, I think, in their heart, but this forced them to take action. And I think that the best ones that I've seen um, are those who have figured out how to do it, not just from their philanthropy or just from their CSR, so ESG kinds of activities, but who have figured out how to integrate it into the actual core of their business strategy and to align their business strategy with some of these broader social and economic and, and environmental uh, imperatives. And I think there are examples all, all over the place, but this crisis has really brought to the fore, I think some tremendous leadership in that area. That's great, Lisa. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I think it is a real sea change to think about companies that, um, you know, really have embraced this notion uh, out of, be it the business roundtable or or the World Economic Forum around uh, stakeholders versus shareholders, uh, and that used to be kind of a fluffy term that I think mostly is broadly accepted. And even if you look at you know the proxy advisory firms, um, uh, you know the Glass Lewis and ISS recommendations uh, this year. Um, it is, you know, they're weighing in on diversity in boards and ESG plans and, um, uh, you know, representation and leadership and things like that, that, you know, they really didn't touch on before. Um, it has gone mainstream in, in a major way, uh, I think, pushed by the, you know, the, the, the social um, 
issues of the last year and also potentially by the pandemic. Um, so, you know, if there's a silver lining to the pandemic around, um, you know, heightened uh, views of corporate responsibility in the private sector, um, you know, that that would be it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, um, trust has been a big, big that's been challenged, uh, you know, and, I, and I obviously in, in the public world and government world, trust was actually really, really challenged. Uh, it didn't matter where you voted and what you did. That was a big deal. I think seeing CEOs and leaders like yourselves come out, you've had to actually talk to your employees differently. You've had actually you've had direct access to them in ways that, very frankly, you didn't exercise probably before the pandemic. And then you did it regularly. I know, you know, Remat Verizon, you guys had, you know, daily conversations, if I'm not mistaken, early on in the pandemic with um, Yeah, with and actually company. we still continue it uh, once or twice a week. So every day uh, at noon, it's up to speed. And during uh, the first months of the pandemic, every single day for half hour at noon, you tune in, you listen to our head of HR, who was the head of the crisis leadership team that we had put together, which was basically comprised of all of the Verizon leadership when we met every morning for an hour to really pull together everything that needed to be taken care of. Um, and then at lunchtime, everybody tuned in, all employees. But the interesting thing was, it wasn't just employees, it was families. Um, everybody could see the work that was being done. So, you know, my daughters would hear who my boss is and, and everybody else as we are having lunch. So it just became part of the family dynamic almost. Um, and I think it made it more real, made it more human. Um, um, you know, uh, you, you think about what you need when you end up in a situation like we've been living through uh, over the last year. And what that meant for a company like Verizon, uh, literally overnight having to switch 130,000 employees to working remotely. Uh, of which not obviously everyone could work remotely, but those that could overnight had to be able to work remotely. And we needed to have all of the tools and technology to do that. But more importantly is the 120 million subscribers uh, to be able to do that remotely without a hitch and making sure that the network could stand up for it. And then to be able to support the technicians that needed to go in, um, you know, virtually to be able to uh, service um, uh, customers and make sure that what we rely on and depend on as a technology was working properly. And then to ensure everybody's health um, and ensure that we were not putting our employees at risk in any way, but still serving the needs of the customers, supporting small business um, as they needed um, to be taken care of as they were shut down. So it was, quite a bit of transition and very, very quickly. And am I right that in the early days of the pandemic, Verizon bought blue jeans? Because I remember thinking um, that was kind of was a sign of where things were heading. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> it was something we had been looking at before. So the, the transaction closed uh, during the pandemic um, and uh, it was very timely. You could see, uh, you could say we were uh, ahead of our time in our thinking, uh, but uh, you know, it, it was definitely beneficial in, in the time frame that we have been living through. So, Tom, you know, this, I guess, conversation that we were talking about before we got on live on the panel and then hearing the, uh, what uh, Reba just said about uh, blue jeans, you know, this remote work, this idea during the pandemic that we can be, actually, we can advance. I mean, there's a lot we can do. Now, again, you brought up a very important point. There are many small businesses that no matter what they have and access to technology, especially restaurants and, you know, uh, and, and small businesses, the lifeblood is being with people um, have suffered a great deal. But for those companies that are technology focused or even finance focused, there's a lot of, you know, changing needs, certainly, but a lot of advancing that went on. How do you think CEOs um, can lead, I guess, their companies uh, to continue developing products? And how do they when they're living in this kind of world order that we live in right now? And how do they deal with the needs that we need to deal with right now? Well, I think it has been a challenge and I think many companies are doing simply a spectacular job in very challenging times. I think this idea <clears throat> that we're going through a secular change where people will no longer come together uh, and work together in groups, you know, I'm, I'm not buying that. 
Mm-hmm. And um, I think that people, you know, underestimate, you know, the, um, the, the power of the a collective IQ of a group. I mean, it's been absolutely, you know, demonstrated unambiguously that the collective IQ of a group is much greater than the sum of its parts. And I can imagine how we will do work that is repetitive in nature or perhaps service in nature and doesn't require innovation. We might be able to do that remotely. But if we want to invent the Apple Mac or the Intel 88 processor or the cell phone or the cure for or or COVID vaccine, I believe if you need to innovate, you need to get very bright people together working elbow to elbow, you know, 27 hours a day, eight days a week and do whatever it takes to get it done. So I think that, you know, innovation and creativity require people working together and, you know, in in person. I think also what has not been measured is the amount of information that is exchanged just by seeing other people work in real time. In other words, we know how much information is goes through email or through voice conferences, but the amount of information that's changed just by seeing people out of the corner of your eye doing things, there is a lot of information content there and it's important and it leads to high performance and high productivity. And I think that those companies that are innovative will be inventing and creating leadership positions. I think they'll get together in teams and, solve problems that have never been solved before. No, I love your, your the, the collective IQ, a pretty powerful thought when you think about it, it's true. And, you know, we, we can be creative in isolation, but even when you think, and even you mentioned it, you know, um, the Pfizer's of the world, for example, they, you know, they're no longer seen as a drug company. They're now, you know, a science company. They've done all their, the, the, the vaccine development, you know, on Zoom. I mean, talking to other scientists around the world, but they created collaboration, but they, even they said when they got to the final, stretch of figuring out how they were going to do it. They had to be in person. They had to sit around, you know, in labs with masks on trying to figure it out. So it's, it's very, it's very telling. Mike, Mike, when I think of your work uh, at uh, MasterCard, I think of you were using words of inclusion uh, and financial inclusion well before the pandemic, certainly, and well before um, any of the, you know, the, the very um, tragic eye-opening moments of 2020. Uh, both from the economic side and the societal side. So tell us a little bit about that, because that builds on this conversation of trust. Uh, and uh, you don't do you don't create a lot of fanfare, I would argue, uh, at MasterCard about that work, but you've been at it globally and in this country for quite a while. We have, we have been at it for the better part of a decade, um, really focused on bringing unbanked and now underbanked individuals into the financial system, giving them an opportunity to get part of the digital economy. And five years ago, we set off the goal of bringing 500 million people into the financial system. We measured it like any other <clears throat> goal of the company. Every region had targets, every country had programs. And we actually met the goal about nine months ahead of schedule, right in the middle of COVID. And we looked around in the context of COVID and it just underscored for us how critically it is important it is to be part of the digital economy, whether you're an individual getting support from your government or your friends or your family or your small business uh, that needs to go digital in order to stay open, become a, a mom and pop store who were brick and mortar, need to become an e-commerce player, they need to get paid, they need to deal with their customers and their suppliers in the digital environment. And so we doubled down and raised our goal to a billion people, 50 million small businesses, 25 million women-owned merchants to bring them into the financial system. And it's deep in our DNA, not just as a nice to do, but because we see ultimately it strengthens our business. If we have half a billion or a billion more people connected to the digital economy, we have more inclusive growth around the world. Those economies are going to thrive. We're going to thrive when they thrive. And so it's, it's in our interest. It's a good thing to do. It's highly motivating for our employees, for our customers, for our partners, uh, for the international organizations that we work with as well, our humanitarian partners. Um, and it, it really helps drive the mission of the organization. Now, has the urgency for this actually, I imagine it has to, right? The urgency for the decade's worth of work actually must be transformational into what you're doing now as well, because it's no longer back burner to the rest of the world, it's front burner. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the conversation around inclusive capitalism or stakeholder capitalism or inclusive growth is really a recognition that 
you know, just looking at the GDP figures isn't enough. When you've got widening income inequality in countries, uh, when people are working but are still poor and you are having a hard time making ends meet, the growth has to be purposefully inclusive and that, in all sorts of ways, meaning people who don't have access, but also looking at diversity and inclusion. Uh, what role, look at the, the role, the, the difficulty that women or founders of color have getting access to venture capital, getting access to risk capital. And they, they have a tiny percentage of the risk capital that's available every year. And looking to figure out why is that the case? What are the obstacles? What can be got, done to ensure that people are looking at the pipeline of, of potential uh, entrepreneurs and uh, funding all those that are meritorious, whether they're run by a woman, run by a black entrepreneur, a black founder. How do we make sure that we're really doing this in an inclusive way? Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to come back to that in a minute because I want to talk about that pipeline uh, with you, Tom, and then also uh, with the work you're doing around the Edison Alliance, you, you Mike, and, and Rima. But, but Lisa, this whole issue of power and pipeline, uh, you have created something on your platform, the Modern Leader Leadership Initiative. Tell us about that because that's actually a different way of demanding uh, and catalyzing uh, inclusivity and diversity through a different part of the board. I mean, everyone now takes the boards differently today than they did a year ago. You, you really are part of the power structure and, they, and the accountability begins there. So tell us a little bit about what happened with the Modern Leadership Initiative if you can as well. Sure, of course. Um, you know, I do, I do want to underline, um, uh, like, I want to hit on two things first. Um, I, I kind of disagree a little bit with Tom, not entirely. I do believe cities are a great source of innovation and energy and passion, and they will come back for sure. Um, but I think people will work differently, and we will be able to tap into um, resources that may not have been available before because they didn't want to live in a certain place or uh, work certain hours. And I think there will be going forward more flexibility around that. Um, so so I, I think there will be a hybrid world where absolutely people get together to share ideas. And, and that part of it is I do believe in person is the best way to do that. But I also think that there will be you know, I feel like I won't drive, fly to New York for for an hour meeting as much as I used to. Uh, and, and the world has changed a little bit from that perspective. Um, but but going back to your question, um, you know, we do hear a lot. Um, there's a pipeline problem. And I'm glad you didn't ask the question of of why is it important uh to uh, to have you know diversity in the workplace and diversity on boards because I do feel like that question has been answered uh, and you know whether you believe it's uh, it's a a uh, uh, you know the right thing to do or not and and I think everyone on this panel feels that it's the right thing to do it is the, certainly the right thing to do from an economic and shareholder value perspective when you look at the the total shareholder returns of companies that have diversity on their boards versus those who don't, the answer is clear that um, that this is a good thing for companies to have a board that looks more like their customer base and more like the communities that they that they operate in. So, um, you know, the why has been largely answered, but then the how becomes the question. So last summer, we dialed up an initiative shortly after uh, the George Floyd incidents in the United States. And um, we uh, we spun up an initiative to allow the 700,000 board members who use our platform today to nominate um, people in underrepresented communities and women who they believe were ready for their first board seat. Because there is a, um, you know, there is a, 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 uh, a network that comes into play. And if you aren't part of the network, um, then you may not even get considered. So, so the idea was to, to sort of break that, um, that, that part of the cycle where if you don't have access, you don't get the offer and then you don't have access and then you don't get the offer. So, um, so we, we dialed these up and the response has been really tremendous. We've had, um, you know, uh, search firms and private equity firms and VC firms as right, as well as just corporations that are already on the diligent network come on and either post positions or nominate um, folks that they believe are are sort of ready for their first board seat. And it's been really heartening to see the way that um, you, know, you can quickly 
uh, move the needle on these things. We've placed people on boards that, uh, that were nominated for the first time on the network. And, um, it's been, uh, it's been really gratifying to see that we can, you know, again, going back to the private sector taking a role and, uh, and trying to help move the needle. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's showing real promise. That's very exciting. And, it, and it's actually scaling, which is pretty amazing as well. Um, I'm going to do something kind of, kind of shameless here. I'm going to show you this book, uh, which I'm reading right now, which you all should get. It's Digital Transformation, and it's by Tom. And it says, Survive and Thrive in an Era of Mass Extinction. And it's an amazing book. Um, you know, when I think about what leaders think about, Tom, I think about, and we're covering it. Lisa just covered a bit of it as well. You know, what keeps leaders up at night, I would say, no one talks about it. It's the culture issues. They've become even more profound uh, in the last year. Uh, climate change still becomes a big issue. There's a lot of challenges. It took a bit of a back burner uh, and, and needed to, but I think it's back on the front burner as well. Um, and, and I would say COVID will continue to be. I mentioned these before. The one that actually I think no one talks enough about is cyber and the, and, and the risks there. And I think that literally is what every, I mean, every one of you actually in many, are software companies in many ways and, and, and technology is everything. Uh, tell us a little bit about these risks and and how we need to address them. They're like the silent cancer in our economy that no one seems to want to address. And just give us a little bit of insight in that, because as I've looked at your book, read your book, and I'm reading your book, it's quite chilling, actually. Well, I think that, uh, you know, we have an issue of trust uh, that it, that is very troubling. You know, as we, as we advance this new, a uh, step function of information technology associated with elastic cloud computing and big data, and we collect these amazing data sets about these massive data sets about people. Um, you know, I think post Snowden uh, and, and post Greenwald, we have <clears throat> you know this these massive intrusions of global information systems by bad actors, rogue actors. Uh, from the uh, Office of Personnel Management. This would include everybody who's ever been considered for a security clearance in the United States. We read that the Russians, okay, have been camped out, okay, in the information systems of the DNC, the RNC, the White House, and the Department of Defense for the last six months. Okay, and not only are they walking off with all this information, they, they are planting trap doors, and this is all well documented. Um, we see the Russians that are using Estonia and the Ukraine as test beds to validate that these wep this weaponry works for shutting down the financial system, shutting down the social uh, welfare systems, uh, shutting down the transportation systems, shutting down the grid, and they work. And um, we are, you know, highly, highly vulnerable to these attacks. And I and yes, is climate change an important issue? Yes, it is. But it might be a luxury item in the sense that we might not be around this this long. And everybody agrees that any sort of kinetic dispute is going to be preceded by a massive cyber attack. Everybody agrees that actors like Iran, China, uh, Russia, and others have the ability to shut down massive sectors of the power grid, massive sectors of the financial system, massive sectors of the healthcare system. The, the, the GPS constellation, and uh, were that to happen, it is, in fact, the end of the world. And, you know, how this is not a front-page item, um, you know, on, you know, on, you know, on every news station and every newspaper is absolutely beyond me. And this is, you know, it's almost as if we don't want to talk about it because we don't want to disclose how big this is. And so I think this is a national emergency, and and I think unless we get it together, we're going to be very sorry. And it sounds like there's also solutions to this. It's not just dire, you know, warnings here, which is huge, but also that there are things that can be done. 
Uh, I think this is going to be a natural application of AI. I think a lot of, I mean, the organizations that have done the best job, and we're, we're involved in these systems all around the world, you know, oil and gas companies and utilities and energy companies and financial institutions and telecommunications companies. I think the, the high water mark, as I can see, are the financial institutions. Okay. I mean, these, these, I mean, you get to places like MasterCard, you get to places like Bank of America, you get to places like Standard Chartered Bank. Okay. And the, you know, the regimes they have in place for data security are daunting. And uh, everything is air gapped. This information is secure. And I think that, um, you know, they are doing what their consumers want. They're, they're being trustworthy. I think the low water mark in 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 it is, you know, if we look at the cybersecurity budgets in in most in most companies, and I'm not in you know primarily in the cybersecurity business, so I'm not selling here, okay? But the the, you know you know, energy companies, utilities spend almost nothing on this. The most vulnerable systems, I think, are in the United States government, okay? Defense and intel systems, and we're involved in those. I'm telling you, I think this is this is a low bar, and as as citizens, I think we need to demand of our service providers and demand of our government that they secure these data and secure these systems, or else uh, we will be quite sorry. So it's it, it's something that we can't hold off on and wait, just like the other issues that we're talking about. Um, and uh, you know, it's very sobering when you and I hear you say that climate change is not our biggest worry. We might not get there to have the problem. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to address is something that it's nice to see collaboration. Uh, you know, in, in the private sector. And I know that Hans Vesberg, uh, the, you know, the CEO of Verizon and Ajay uh, Banga, who's the executive chairman of MasterCard, uh, came together at the World Economic Forum recently and, and launched under Hans's chairmanship, the Edison Alliance. And I know Rima, you and Mike in particular are, are sitting on that, uh, that that group. And really, it's really about, we, we keep talking about the deserts uh, and, you know, the healthcare desert, the education desert, the food desert, the access to capital, all the things that frankly have become even more urgent and more, and we're more aware of over the last year um, and the inequalities that exist. You know, the real urgent issue here is broadband. And it does actually fit with what Tom was just saying. It does fit with what Lisa was just describing because without broadband, we can't do uh, what we need to do. Uh, so if you just tell us a little bit about this World Economic Forum uh, Alliance uh, that you're part of and, and frankly, how does that actually how can we make sure that digital inclusion uh, has a higher impact or, or, or a greater impact on our quality of life, not just for those who have access, but those who need to have it? Yeah, um, uh, thanks. Uh, I, I think um, it, it, you mentioned the deserts, the different types of deserts, and you think about it in the context of the sustainable development goals. And um, each one of those goals is trying to address a specific issue. At the heart of most of the sustainable development goals and all of the issues that we have been talking about is technology. And uh, the fact is there isn't one goal to try to address what, what are we going to do about um, inclusion and access to broadband. Um, so that is fundamentally what we are trying to do with the Edison Alliance is bring together public, private, and globally look at how are we going to resolve this issue. It cannot be done alone by one country, by one company, or one uh, convening body. It, it, all of us coming together and really bringing our expertise and, and trying to address um, how we are going to solve this. Um, so we've set up the Edison Alliance where uh, the World Economic Forum convenes the group. Um, we have um, Hans Vesberg as the, uh, the, the chair of the, of the group, and then we have convened a board um, as part of the Edison Alliance, and MasterCard is on the board, and then we've got representation, representation. healthcare, um, education, and uh, also governments. Um, and then we've got uh, a series of champions that will be working with us. Um, it's a three-year program. Uh, the objective uh, of this is to create uh, concrete actions, uh, use real life cases of um, areas that uh, in the first year we've decided to target the three things that we've experienced as a result of the pandemic. Um, uh, the first one being financial inclusion, 
healthcare and education. Those are the things that we've noticed. Uh, there, there have been gaps and that there are solutions that would leverage technology. So we are targeting very concrete um, use cases of how we are going to advance those things. In the, in the following years, we will add additional initiatives and additional focus areas, but probably the, the three first focus areas will continue over the, the three years. Three years. And, um, it is going to be very pragmatic, very practical, looking at already, what already exists and trying to tie um, all of the different initiatives together and, and move them forward. Um, because we have been trying to solve the problems a lot of times in silos and trying to solve the same problem over and over again. And this isn't an issue that is geographically based from there over there, everywhere, everywhere. everywhere. What we've experienced during the pandemic is the types of um, digital deserts and challenges that we are seeing in places like Africa exist in our own backyard. Um, I, I mean, we have real live cases of students literally sitting outside of a Starbucks because that's where the Wi-Fi connection is outdoors uh, for the full day because that's the only way they can uh, take online courses. In the middle of winter, no less, in some cases. In the middle, middle of winter and, uh, you know, um, um, using their phones. So these are real issues we have to solve. always brings with it risks but i still believe overall the benefit is greater than the risks and i don't think we can really go backwards we just have to figure out how we address the cyber security as much as cyber security at the same time as we, we leverage the benefits and, and mike you know i know this is a big this is an issue that's close to your heart at mastercard but this whole issue that you've been working on both in government and also at mastercard is about trust uh, and, and i know that's a big driver for you with the edison alliance as well well, absolutely. And when you take Rima's comments and Tom's comments together, you really see the, the opportunity and the challenge ahead. Uh, we've got so much work to do to ensure that our economy is fully inclusive, inclusive and that everyone is able to participate. But as more and to zero cyber protection. So we got to get them online. We've got to help them maintain their business and their business. But we also need to make sure that they make sure that they can protect them and they can protect themselves and engage safely online. The whole issue around um, for example, reverse Miranda, the idea that companies, you know, the Miranda says, you know, anything you say can't be used against you. In the cyber world, there's been a proposal we should have a reverse Miranda. So companies should come forward and talk about and admit when they've been hacked so that they can share best practices with other companies, other sectors, companies other sectors, without the risk that they're going to be facing um, uh, prosecution or liability or, or any other, uh, or any other downsides. Um, uh, so there's some things. And I guess it goes back to your collaborative IQ, Tom, and that if we bring companies and leaders together, we can solve major issues and major challenges, which I think it sounds like this you're taking on a big one for the next three years with the Edison Alliance. I wanted to spend the next few minutes, and we only have a few left, to go personal here for a moment a little bit, because, you know, uh, when I talk to leaders and CEOs and I think about role models like yourselves, you know, in my own case, I keep jokingly talk about pre-pandemic Allen, pandemic Allen, and, and I'm just starting to get to know what, what I might imagine, I might imagine what it will be like, both as a CEO like, oh, and as CEO work. And, work. and I'm just curious, and you guys, you know, post-pandemic Lisa, you know, compare her to a little bit of the of where we are right now. What are you going to do differently in your leadership and, and what should we expect from other leaders as well? And let's go around that. Eh? Let's, let's, let's kind of introduce what we're trying to define right now as our post-pandemic selves, I guess. 
Sure. Um, well, first, uh, uh, if Tom didn't, Tom didn't scare us enough uh, with his end of the world comments, there's another great book called Countdown to Zero Day that will keep you up all night uh, if, uh, if, you, if you're not scared enough already. Um, you know, I, I do think there is a, a pre-pandemic and a post-pandemic. You know, specifically for me, I know my team a lot better now. Uh, I know their dogs and their kids and their husbands and, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the struggles and the people who've gotten sick and, um, you, know, you know, there's just, it, it does feel like we have been in people's homes for a year. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, that I think is one of the, again, the silver linings of the pandemic. And I think it, um, it helps with, um, you know, empathy and, uh, and leading a team and understanding that, um, you know, people have different things to juggle in their lives and, and you know, helping them make it work uh, is really, really important. And I think that's going to be really key as we think about coming out of the pandemic and the people who have been most adversely affected by the pandemic are people of color and women. And if you look at the January jobs report in the United States, 100 percent of the job loss was women. Uh, and so uh, many people say that the pandemic has set back uh, women and minorities years and years from where they were pre-pandemic. So I do think that coming out of it, uh, uh, you know, my personal uh, goal will be to try to help address some of those things, uh, both for my company and more broadly. Speaking of dogs, mine just busted in. <laughs> <laughs> very, very normal. Uh, Tom, what about you? I'm not sure there is a post-pandemic world. I think we may just live in a pandemic world for some time, and I think it's going to be incumbent upon us uh, to who are leaders and employers Players. to make sure that we're providing uh, uh, safe, safe workplaces for our employees, and with the technologies are becoming available to assure that. Uh, I think that also we need to assure that you know, in fact, that our political leaders around the world are really making science-based decisions, not just using, you know, science as a as a means for making political, you know, what are, you know, for political decisions. decisions. No base, no science. Base. And so and I know that, you know, our focus will be on making sure that we provide a safe working environment for our employees all around the world and doing our best to hold our leaders accountable for making, you know, well-grounded decisions based upon science. Yeah. So we got three minutes left. So kind of like quick round robin here, Rima. Um, I agree with what Lisa said. I agree with what Tom said. I don't believe there's going to be as much difference, much difference work Rima and home Rima. I think that comes together. And I don't believe that, um, we are really going to get out of the pandemic mentality. I think that's going to stay with us and the changes in the importance of corporate responsibility or whatever we want to call it remains. And that becomes uh, the fourth uh, area that we will continue to focus on as private enterprise. I, I will say this. I thought that the fact that we focused on employees would have been the first thing that would have been lost, have been lost when the pandemic when started. The pandemic. And it's turned out to be the thing that we focused on the most during this whole period. Uh, and that's, uh, Mike, uh, that's a big deal for you as well. So what, what would you say post Yeah, no, Mike? I agree with everything. Look, <laughs> I think we are much more focused on, I feel much more connected to not only the physical health, but the mental health of my of my team, to what's going on with their families and understanding the stresses of being a parent or being single or being away from one's family in another country. Yeah. Um, and uh, really uh, having, uh, having a sympathetic, a decent uh, culture around that that can help support people with flexibility and still try and get some of the, the benefits of collaboration that come from, from being face to face. So I think that's going to be our challenge going forward. I think, uh, I think that that's actually a, uh, um, a, a huge thing. Look within and make sure that we, that you said it, Tom too, safe and, and the health uh, of our employees uh, around the world, probably first world, and foremost, probably, foremost. I guess to your other point, you know, be the, the safety and the health, of our communities and our customers and our uh, colleagues, you know, when we're talking about technology and, and frankly, uh, the bad actors out there and how we can avoid and then actually protect ourselves from them as well. Um, but there's a lot of positive here, a lot of good energy here on the offense. And I think you guys represent 
in your leadership also thinking preemptively about the risks as well. Well, so going going forward, move forward, maximize these opportunities. There's a lot of uncertainty. And how do we minimize and mitigate the risk? There's a lot of uncertainty still there as well. Um, I will say this, though. I'm more optimistic knowing you all and the work that you're doing uh, than pessimistic. We need to do is have more of you, more time with you, but also more people like you um, uh, and the, and the uh, priorities that you represent. So thank you. Thank you for doing this today. I wish we had more time. More time. I'm looking forward to our conversations and other opportunities, and opportunities that we can come together because, because uh, as you said, uh, the, the collective IQ uh, and EQ um, goes up when we're all together. So thank you. Uh, both Mike, Rima, Lisa, and Tom, and I look forward to our next. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.